even their false views, Paul gives credence to the resurrection, even in their false views. It's almost like the atheist saying, we don't need a God to treat people good, but the atheist is using the standard established by the God that they say that don't even exist. There is no good, there is no standard of what's right or what's wrong without God. Amen. Paul has already addressed the what ifs. What if there is no resurrection? If you'll notice in chapter 15, starting at verse 12, all the way through verse 19, there's a series of conditional clauses, if clauses. Right. Now, if Christ is preached that he has not been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? That's the first question. Verse 13, if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. In verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith is also in vain. Moreover, he says, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ from the dead, whom he did not raise, if, in fact, the dead are not raised, for if the dead are not raised, verse 16, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. He highlights the reality of the resurrection and if there is no resurrection, we are doomed. Paul goes on to say we are among most men to be pitied. Listen, all that we do, all that we sacrifice is to no avail if there is no resurrection. Conditional clause if. Verse 18, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hope in Christ, in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. He gives a strong defense of the resurrection and then he goes on and talks about what God, what Christ is going to do at the end. He is going to subject all things back unto the Father. The things that the first Adam did not complete, that Jesus completed. And there is going to come a time when he is going to subject everything back to the Father that God would be all in all. This morning as we move to verse 29, we see the false view of the resurrection is addressed. Goes back to the if clauses in verse 29. He says, otherwise, what will those who are baptized for, what will those do who are baptized for the dead if the dead are not raised at all? Why then are they baptized for them. <laughs> this should have been a verse I should have let one of the other ministers preach on. <laughs> but it's really not that complicated. It is probably one of the most uh, confused verses in the Bible because Paul now brings up an issue. He is seemingly to addressing an issue of the baptism for the dead. And so the question is, where does that come from? Otherwise, he says, what will those who are baptized for the dead, if the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized? You know, there are so many translations and understandings of this verse, but I believe if you keep it in context, it is very, very clear. Paul is addressing the false teachers, and the false teachers have Yeah. 
He says, if the dead are not raised at all, there is no scriptural support to baptism for the dead. Zero. You find it nowhere in the scriptures when you see people being baptized for those who have died. Listen, that's why we need to have a sense of urgency during these last few years, during this pandemic. We've seen healthy people die of a pandemic from getting COVID. And listen, if they have not responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ before they die, before they die, they are eternally separated from a God who loved them and loved them so much that he sent his only son to die for their sins. And so there is no scriptural support for the baptism for the dead. I believe that the warning that will be given in point number four, which will be coming up, highlights the fact that those who are making these false claims about the resurrection don't even know God. Listen to me. We're living in a time when there is so much chatter and they put the name God or Jesus on the end of their chatter. And so what, what people are being led in the name of God. Paul says they don't even know him. These will be the groups of people in Matthew chapter 7 starting in verse 21 that say in the last day many will come to me and say Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? We preach, we proclaim your name, we cast out many demons in your name. We were in the deliverance ministry. says to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So don't get it twisted. Paul is not affirming this false teaching. He is simply using this false teaching against them to highlight the fact that even if there were resurrection, even if there were baptism for the dead, how could that be if there is no resurrection? That's the point that Paul is making. So first we see in verse 29, a false view of the resurrection is addressed. Secondly, we see the dangers associated with the resurrection are real. Brother Kid and I were talking this morning, we talk about the gospel, we, and we talk about the death and the burial and the resurrection. There is no gospel message without the death, burial, and the resurrection. But you got to know that there dangers associated with propagating the gospel message. Paul says in verse 30, why are we also in danger every hour? Why are they in danger? Because of the gospel. Listen, this is why Paul says I'm not ashamed of it because Paul understood and understands that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Folk can't get saved without hearing the gospel. Somebody said to me that the gospel is just baby stuff. No, listen, the, the gospel is not baby stuff. The gospel is the means for us getting saved. We're all saved because we responded to the death, burial, and resurrection. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, Anyone else is 
bold. I am speaking in foolishness. I too am bold. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am speaking as if insane. I much more. In four more labors, Paul says, and four more imprisonments, beaten times without number. There's danger associated with propagating the gospel message. Beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Why are 
we also in danger, he says, every hour. That's a daily thing. We, we, we're in danger, Paul. As we go on, we'll see that Paul's daily affirmations are a reality. The danger is real and he affirms his reality. Watch what he says here in verses 31 and verse 32. Paul's daily affirmations are a reality. First of all, he says in verse 31 that my mission is clear. My mission is clear. He says, I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, that I die daily. Paul says basically that I die daily. In fact, Jesus told his disciples, if you desire to be my disciple, you must take up your cross daily and follow me. Now what is he saying? He's saying that if you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, then your desires must die. If he is the king, if he is the ruler of your life, that means that he is calling the shots in your life, your
he says, and by the way, uh, Paul is at Ephesus. Um, when he gets there at Ephesus, verse 11 says, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. And so that, listen, when you see a powerful work of God, look for the enemy to be around, waiting in the cup. Listen, do you realize there's not a time in this life where we can just relax? It's, Brother Dan, and we, we always have to be on guard when things are going uh, the very best in our lives is when we need to be on guard the most. And so God is doing some extraordinary things there in, in Ephesus. And then all of a sudden, verse 21, Now after these things were finished, Paul purposed in the spirit to go to Jerusalem after he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having said it to Macedonia, two of those who ministered with him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed at Achaia for a while, at Asia for a while. About that time, there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way. <laughs> Translation, all hell is about to break loose. <laughs> For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. In other words, Artemis was, he was, he was in the prime of his business. He was making a lot of, of money making these shrines of Artemis. Goes on to say, these he gathered together, verse 25, these he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades and said, men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. Messing with his money. Got his mind on his money and his money on his mind. He said, this apostle Paul is, is messing with my business. He said in verse 26, he says, you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in all Not only is there danger that this trade of ours fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless, and she who all of Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificence. When they heard this, they were filled with rage and began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed with one another, with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. They, these folk are hot. Verse 30, And when Paul wanted to go into the assembly, the disciples would not let them. Also, some of them, I don't even know how to pronounce that word, Asos, who were friends of the, sent them to repeatedly urge them not to venture into the theater. And long story short, Paul escaped that region because they were going to kill him because of the gospel message. So he says, if, verse 32 of 1 Corinthians 15, if from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? The moment in point C matters. He says, if the dead are not raised, all of this stuff that we've done, is worth nothing at all. 
He says, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. For if there is no resurrection, then live your life and die. Paul saying, how do you, how you live does not matter if there is no resurrection. If you believe this, then you will make a difference in how you live. Listen, the decisions that you make in life, it should reflect that there is a resurrection. If there is no resurrection, then you can do what you want to do. And it doesn't really matter. But if there is a resurrection, then what you do really does matter. That's why for the believer, we're living not as much for this life, but the one to come. If you believe that there's a resurrection, then every moment matters. If you believe that there's a resurrection, then there should be a difference in how you live on a day-to-day -day basis. And so Paul concludes with a warning. Paul's view of the resurrection is addressed in verse 29, verse 30. The dangers associated with the resurrection are real. Verse 31 and 32, Paul's daily affirmations are a reality. And then lastly, in verses 33 and 34, Paul's warning to be alert. Verse 33, do not be deceived. We just stop right there for a minute. Paul is warning these believers in Corinth, don't be deceived, there is deception out there. There are those who are planted, whose goal is to lead you not to God, but to lead you away from God. And by the way, one of the ways of leading you away from
because she never responded to Jesus Christ. So he changed his theology and says, hey, everybody goes to heaven. Listen, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Paul saying, listen, don't get led astray. We're off course when it comes to the truth of the gospel, namely the resurrection. Don't get caught drifting because bad company corrupts good morals. Paul here highlights a, a simple principle. My dad would say it this way. This is the Roy Donaldson translation. If you lie down with dogs, you will wake up with fleas. Paul saying, listen, wake up. Be alert. These folks
For some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So become sober minded and stop sinning. Say stop sinning. Stop sinning. Listen, you have to tell yourself no. That's what Paul says. Listen, I died daily. Listen, your desires, when your desires rise up, they have a tendency to overrule what God is actually saying in your life. You have to stop. You say, well,
speaks up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your disobedience is complete. Listen to me. He says, I speak this to your shame. Why? He says, for some have no knowledge of God. Folk preaching and teaching false doctrine don't know God. The very ones propagating these false views of the resurrection are the ones who claim to have a relationship with God, but the reality is they don't know God. From the beginning, man has been deceived about the nature of God. And no matter what they say, their fruit should be examined. Unfortunately, the influence of the false teachers is taking root because most of us are so gullible. And Paul says, I, I speak this to your shame. Time for us to grow up. It's time to be aware of what's going on with the enemy's schemes are. Paul highlights today a false view of the resurrection. He addresses it. He addresses the dangers associated with the resurrection. He says they are very, very real. When he took on the gospel message, there was danger daily in the life of Paul. He had daily affirmations. It was a reality for him. And then lastly, Paul warns us to be alert. I think on last week I mentioned Jude. Jude says, listen, I wanted to write to you to talk about the common salvation that we share. But I felt it necessary for me to write to you and urge you to contend for the faith that was once and for all entrusted to the saints. The resurrection is a reality. And because the resurrection is a reality, it ought to make a difference in how we live today. Father, help us. Help us as we examine our own lives. God, we ask, first of all, that you would forgive us. Forgive us for being so gullible. Forgive us for living in the flesh. Your word reminds us that without holiness, no man shall see God. God, we thank you for the hope that we have because of the resurrection. God, we, we pray right now that if there are those under the sound of my voice that have not made you Lord of their lives, your word says if we confess with our minds, when we believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. So if that's you and you have a desire to experience the resurrected life, knowing that when you die, you will be eternally connected to God through Christ Jesus, through the gospel, through his death, burial, and resurrection. Just pray this prayer. There's no magic in the prayer, but there's power in the prayer. Power to save. God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. 
I live life on my terms. And so I ask that you will forgive me. I realize that I am a sinner. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe that he was buried and God raised him from the dead according to the scriptures. So God, you said if we confess with our mouths and we believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead, we will be saved. Thank you for saving me. Now God, I ask that you would teach me Teach me what it means to live victoriously in Christ. Teach me who I am in Christ as a new creation. Old things have passed away. And yet this flesh, I have to learn how to kill it daily. Thank you for your spirit, the Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. That raised us up same spirit that will give life to our mortal bodies. Equip me to live victoriously in Christ. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you're online, if you could call the number um, to the church and we will reach out to you wherever you are. If you're here, you prayed that prayer for the first time. I want you to come home. I want you to stand and come forward. It's your desire to begin a new walk with Christ. It's time to stop playing. The resurrection is true, and it should make a difference in how we live from day to day. Let's stand together. Father, we bless you. We thank you so much for the privilege of worship. Lord, as we leave this place, will you equip us to do battle? For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against powers, principalities, and spiritual wickedness in high places. Lord, equip us for the battle that we might be victorious and give you the glory. For it's in Jesus' name, for his sake, that we pray and ask all of these things. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. We are dismissed.